If um, everyone could turn to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah 50. And I'm going to read the first three verses. We're going to start a new series of studies for um, these day in the words. In uh, the book of Jeremiah, we're going to try and go through doing this one Sunday a month. I don't know how far we're going to get. But we're going to try and go through and... Um, and understand these chapters as, as uh, well as we can, uh, given the new information that we've learned since May 21 as we've entered into the Day of Judgment. And, you know, by the way, we can expect to learn, not only to continue to learn, but to learn more than we've, present, we've previously learned. We know that God opened up the Bible. He unsealed the scriptures beginning uh, at the start of the Great Tribulation. But God also says concerning the Day of Judgment in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the Day of Wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There, God is referring to the, the day of wrath, the day of judgment. And notice, He says it's not only a day of wrath, but a day of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Which means that when we enter into the period of judgment day, we should learn more about Judgment Day itself. And uh, that's um, exactly what's been going on as we uh, have come to understand that God's judgment is a spiritual judgment to begin with as He shut the door to heaven. Uh, by the way, did anybody, when the door to heaven was open, any, anybody ever see that door? Anybody ever see that door up in the sky? Did you? You did? Well, <laughs> uh, maybe that's not the best question to ask. <laughs> but we've never seen the door of heaven when it was open. We never saw it open. And, and now God has shut it. And, and people say, well, I don't see it shut. Well, if you never saw it open, why do you think you would see it shut? It, it's a spiritual door. Christ is the door. He's the one that, that ministers the opening, the entrance into the kingdom of God. And He's the one that shuts it. As He says, what He opens, no man can shut. And what He shuts, no man can open. And I'm afraid we have some people desperately trying to open up a door right now that they think that, um, I, I guess, that e-Bible shut it. We didn't shut any door. We, we don't have that kind of power. Only God can shut the door to heaven. And when He does, well, all sorts of people may implore Him and beseech Him and say, Lord, Lord, uh, open to us. And, and yet, God doesn't open after that point. He, he just um, exclaims, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Yes? It, well, yeah, we, we do find in, um, I don't know if it uses the word door there. It, it says ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. But in a sense, that is the door because Christ is the Son of Man. Um, and, and again, that would be spiritual language because we never see anyone uh, ascend up to heaven when they became saved or descend uh, immediately as God sends them forth with the gospel. But anyway, in Jeremiah 50, in Jeremiah 50, we're um, Lord willing going to go through this as much as we can. And um, in order to understand Babylon better, because if we understand Babylon better, we're going to understand the day we're living in better. Uh, there, there's a lot of information that God 
gives describing the judgment upon Babylon. And let me read these verses uh, in first three verses of Jeremiah 50. The word that Jehovah spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet, declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Say Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. And I'll stop reading there. Now if I asked everyone here, who does Babylon represent? I'm, I'm afraid that a lot of you are going to raise your hands and say the church. A lot of you are going to raise your hands and say the church because we've learned that over the years. And actually the church, when it fell to Satan, became a part of Babylon. But Babylon, um, spiritually, was in existence before then. And in order to understand Jeremiah 50 and 51, or Revelation 17 and 18, or the, the statements like in Revelation 14, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. In order to understand all that, we have to properly understand who is Babylon, who does Babylon represent. And so let, let's begin with that uh, by looking at some verses and then we'll, we'll just think about it and we'll, uh, we'll come to a determination as to who Babylon represents. In Jeremiah 25, it says, beginning in verse 8, and I'll read through 11. Therefore, thus saith Jehovah of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith Jehovah, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So here, historically, God is saying that he's had enough of his um, people, the nation of Judah, he's had enough of their rebelliousness, of their sins, and so he's going to raise up a nation, Babylon, and he even calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And he is going to use Babylon to come against his people Judah to judge them. And notice he says, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seven years. It wasn't only Judah, but surrounding nations as well that God gave over into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. So the, the question we want to determine is, if Babylon is coming against Judah, then uh, for these 70 years, God has given them up into the hands of the Babylonians, then who does Babylon represent and who does Judah represent? And we, we know for sure that Judah represents the churches and the congregations, that the spiritually, God identifies Israel or Judah with the New Testament church. And Babylon is that which God is using to destroy Judah or destroy the church and uh, for the period of the 70 years. And that 70 years typifies what? The Great Tribulation time. It, it's one of the historical types that God uses. The seven years of Joseph's day is one. 23 years of 609 to 587 inclusive is another. 
and seven years from 609 to 539 is another historical type of the Great Tribulation. And so God um, brings judgment after 70 years. It says in verse 12 of Jeremiah, 12, uh, Jeremiah 25, And shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith Jehovah, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. So after the 70 years, God will punish Babylon. Does he punish Babylon during the 70 years? No. He, he's prospering Babylon during the 70 years. Babylon is overcoming Judah and all these nations. Their, um, their nation of Babylon is increasing. Their kingdom is expanding. It's a wonderful and glorious time for Babylon during the 70 year period. Now, uh, compare that to Satan. As the king of Babylon, we know, typifies Satan and the emissaries of Satan as his kingdom. When God loosed Satan and he entered into the churches and the congregations, was God judging the spiritual Babylon of Satan and his kingdom? Satan was uh, rejoicing. It was a glorious time for Satan when he took over the churches and congregations of the world, when all churches in all the world came under his rule and he began to reign as the man of sin. God wasn't judging him. That's exactly what he wanted. God was judging the church and using Satan as an instrument of judgment to bring the, the punishment against the churches and congregations of the world. So God says historically to Babylon, 70 years, you're my servant, you accomplish my purpose, but after 70 years, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. And, and so the judgment upon Babylon coming after 70 years isn't picturing the judgment on the church. It's picturing the judgment at the end of the time period of the judgment on the church. Or in other words, the 23 year actual time of the Great Tribulation. God isn't judging Babylon then, but when the Great Tribulation concludes, that's like the end of the 70 years. And then God turns to the one he, he had raised up to wreak havoc in the congregations of the world and says, now it's your turn to be judged, Satan. Now it's your turn to be judged, uh, Babylon. And, and that's the, the picture that we have to understand, uh, that, that um, Babylon is representative of the kingdom of Satan and the king of Babylon of Satan himself. Now let's look at a second point in Jeremiah 29. And the first point would be God's judgment comes after 70 years upon Babylon, which would uh, relate to judgment coming after the period of the Great Tribulation. In Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elisa the son of Shaphan and Gemariah the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, 
whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto Jehovah for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which ye cause to be dreamed, for they pro prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith Jehovah. For thus saith Jehovah, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And I'll, I'll stop reading there. So what is God saying in, back in verse 4? Unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. And let's, before we answer that question, let's also look at Jeremiah 24, where the Lord sets up an illustration of good and bad figs. In Jeremiah 24, in verse 5, Thus saith Jehovah the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me that I am Jehovah, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith Jehovah, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem, that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt, and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. So here God is saying, if you go to Babylon, you're like good fruit. You're a good fig and you're going to be blessed. If you remain in Judah, your evil fruit and you can expect the wrath of God. You can expect all these negative things that come upon you. And, and that relates to God's command to come out of the church as Judah represents the church. And, and God commanded his people to come out of her, to come out, to depart out of the midst of Judea, to flee to the mountains. And he did it for our benefit because. He, he wasn't working in the churches of the world, but he was sending forth the latter rain to save a great multitude outside of the church. But the picture here, there's Judah, which clearly represents the church. And Babylon, God commands to go to. So how can Babylon also represent the church? That, that makes no sense. God is commanding you to flee Judea, which represents the church, to go to Babylon, which represents the church. Babylon cannot represent the church in this passage, can it? Or in Jeremiah 29. But, and we've understood it to represent the world, haven't we? You have to leave Judea when God commanded the Jews and go into captivity. And we correctly understood that to mean we have to leave the church and go out into the world. Uh, we're no longer a member of any congregation. We're no longer under spiritual rule. No pastor has any oversight over us. That, that's what that meant. Well, then what does that mean Babylon represents? The world. And that's consistent with the idea of after 70 years, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation because that's Satan and his kingdom. And his kingdom is the world. Um, he, he included the churches and congregations when God delivered it to him at the end of the church age. And then they became part 
of the kingdom of Satan, of Babylon. But remember, you know, that uh, Babylon is called a harlot in Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, um, I'd like to read more, but we'll, we'll just read verses 4 and 5. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon is the mother. The mother may give birth to offspring who, uh, or actually to look at it another way, if you join together with a harlot, what does God say? You become one with the harlot. In, in 1 Corinthians 6, God um, makes that connection in... Verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two, saith he shall be one flesh. So the world is the harlot. Satan's kingdom of darkness is the mother of harlots. And the world began to play around. I mean, the church began to play around with the world and to go after the things of the world, and they became one with spiritual fornication with Babylon, and they became a harlot themselves. Uh, you know, God says in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 1, he, he asked the excellent question in verse 21, how is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. How did the church of Christ become a harlot and become part of Babylon? Well, the answer is righteousness lodged in it. That's past tense. And who is righteousness but the Lord Jesus? He is righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says. But now, murderers. That is, but now, righteousness is no longer lodging in it. Because God came out of the midst of the congregations, and immediately, the instant that the Holy Spirit came out of the midst of the church, and Satan was loosed and entered in, she became a harlot. Because... There is no longer any righteousness within it. And, and by the way, that's how we know every church in all the world is spiritually dead. Because it doesn't matter what they teach. What matters is if they have righteousness, the Lord Jesus, in the midst. And they do not because God ha has clearly declared that uh, He is judging His church and, and the Holy Spirit will leave the congregations there is no comforter, it says in Lamentations, in Jerusalem or Judah, or which would point to the churches any longer. The comforter has left them comfortless. And that's how the church became a harlot. But the harlot had already existed. The harlot was the kingdom of Satan. So that's the second thing, that when God commands to leave Judea and go to Babylon. Babylon can only typify the world. There, there's no other possibility. It must typify the world. And, well, let's look at a third thing in Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah 13, and maybe you've noticed this before. Maybe um, you haven't thought about it. But in Isaiah 13, in verse 1, it says, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. The burden of Babylon. Now, when God uses that kind of language, and he, he uses it fairly frequently, it, he normally goes on to talk about the nation that, that's in view. For instance, look at Isaiah 15, verse 1. 
the burden of Moab because in the night R of Moab is laid waste. And then look at the, the chapter, verse 2, you see Moab mentioned. In verse 4, Moab's mentioned. Verse 5, Moab. Verse 8, Moab. The burden of Moab. And then the Lord goes on to discuss Moab. And look at Isaiah 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. And, and then if you read through the chapter, verse 2, I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. Verse 4, the Egyptians are mentioned and so on. It's, it's a chapter that mentions Pharaoh and Zone and Egypt throughout. It's the burden of Egypt and God goes on to discuss Egypt. And in Isaiah uh, 21, 13, the burden upon Arabia and in, in verse 17, it mentions Kedar, um, which, which is um, um, it, it, it's a name that identifies with Arabia. And in verse 16 also. In verse, Isaiah 23, verse 1, the burden of Tyre, how ye ships of Tarshish. And then the whole chapter, is, it speaks of Tyre and Tarshish. So in other words, when God uses this kind of language, the burden of a particular nation. He continues discussing that nation throughout and in, in all these places throughout the chapter. But when we go back to Isaiah 13, the burden of Babylon, and then what do we read? Well, in, in verse 4, the noise of a multitude and the mountains like as of a great people a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. Jehovah of hosts musters the host of the battle. Uh, um, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even Jehovah, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Whole land. How ye, for the day of Jehovah is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one in another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay the haughtiness, will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. It begins with the burden of Babylon. And then God talks about judgment day, the day of the Lord. N notice the, the darkening of the sun and the moon causing her light not to shine, which happens when, according to Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation. What did God say about Babylon? After 70 years, after 70 years, I will punish you, the king of Babylon and that nation. And now he's talking about the burden of Babylon and he, he gives us language that identifies with immediately after the tribulation of those days. And he says, and I will punish the world. Do you see the correlation? You see how they, they fit together very well? And then um, if we would continue reading, look at verse 13 of Isaiah 13. Therefore, I, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place and the wrath of Jehovah of hosts. And in the day of his fierce anger, it's continuing with the theme of judgment day. And shall be as the chase row and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall, they shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, 
they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. Why the Medes? Why will he stir up the Medes against them? Because of Cyrus, who came against Babylon and when? Immediately after 70 years. God actually gives us a record of it in Daniel 5. You know, the king of Babylon and the lords of Babylon were having a party. They were in a banquet of wine. And they, they had no idea that the enemy nation of the Medes and the Persians was marching against them. Or else they, they would have been on alert. They wouldn't have been... They wouldn't have been in that banquet hall. And the king wouldn't have seen the writing on the wall. But what happens? Look at Daniel, Daniel 5. And it says in verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And they were using the vessels of the temple of Jerusalem when, when they were drinking. And then... Um, Daniel interprets the writing to indicate that um, verse 28, Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain and Darius the Median, who's also known as Cyrus, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. How could that happen? Well, historically, if you read some commentaries, they, they speculate on uh, a riverbed that dried up and the Medes and the Persians just went right down this riverbed. If it were, there was water there, they wouldn't have been able to do it. I think they say they stopped it up. And that allowed them access to the city. And they took Babylon without hardly a fight, with, with no battle. And actually, God um, says that in Jeremiah. Well, I don't know where it is. But it's in, in Jeremiah. <laughs> but God says that the, the men of Babylon, the mighty men of Babylon, for Forborn, oh, here it is in Jeremiah 51, in verse 30. The mighty men of Babylon have forborn to fight, they have remained in their holds, their might has failed, they became as women, they have burned her dwelling places, her bars are broken. One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken at one end, and that the passages are stopped, and, and so on. So they, they were taken without a fight. This, this fierce king and nation were taken suddenly, just like what? Like Christ coming as a thief in the night, as we read of the Lord Jesus. Cyrus came in the night, and took the kingdom of Babylon, and there wasn't even a fight. And, and that happened in the year 539 B.C., after a full 70-year period. And then God, um, he, he fulfilled His word. He said, after 70 years, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. And He did it historically. And what does that represent? Well, it means that God is saying after the 23-year period of the Great Tribulation, immediately after, I will punish Satan and that kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. And how is God going to punish Satan? I mean, we, we're still here. The, the world has continued on. Well, remember, Satan was loosed and given rule over the churches and congregations for, for a period of time, 42 months, it says in Revelation 11. And that is another figure of the entire Great Tribulation period. Following 42 months, what happens? He's put down, 
and he ceases to rule in the church and in the world because he also was ruling in the world. But Christ has taken over Babylon. Yes, believe it or not, right now the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is reigning, who is victorious on the day of judgment on May 21. And I know all kinds of people are saying, are you kidding? It's been so difficult and, and so uh, severe a test since that date. How could Christ take the kingdom? Well, what happens to the believers like Daniel when we go into the next chapter of Daniel? In chapter 6, there is a favorable king to Daniel. Cyrus is the king over Babylon. That he, he not only likes Daniel, he highly respects him. And he doesn't want any harm to come to him at all. But it just so happens, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, that Daniel must be thrown into a lion's den for a night. For one night, he's thrown into the lion's den. Is Daniel being tried and tested during that period of time? And that we can see how it relates to these days where God is testing his people that uh, we are also, we are also um, living under uh, a good ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, yet it's according to his design and by his will that we be tried before he brings his people into the promised land of the kingdom of heaven. He did it with the Jews when he brought them out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt after a great deliverance. Do you think that wilderness was what the Jews were expecting? When, when they were freed from their slavery and bondage? And they, they weren't expecting to be severely tried. But God tried them for 40 years before permitting them. And most of them failed the test before permitting them to enter into the land of Canaan, into the promised land. Well, uh, let's, let's just go back to Isaiah 13. And we see why God says, I will stir up the Medes against them, because the Medes are ruled over by Cyrus. And you don't have to turn there, but let me just remind everyone what God says of Cyrus in Isaiah 45, 1, Thus saith Jehovah to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and, and so on. The word anointed is the word Messiah. And it's the same word Messiah that's found in Daniel. So Cyrus clearly is a picture of Christ, and he's the one that takes the kingdom of Babylon. The Lord stirs up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver and gold. They shall not delight in it. And, and their bows shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. You know, it, it, it is, there's no pleasure in the death of the wicked, God says, and the people of God take no pleasure in saying that the door is shut. And, and yes, um, understanding that means certain things. And it means that uh, God's salvation is not presently available. And this is a hard thing. And, and yet God is indicating here that the Medes who would be led by Cyrus, the Lord Jesus Christ, when they take Babylon, will have no pity on the fruit of the womb, or their eyes shall not spare children. And then look at verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. So that confirms it. That confirms that God has followed the same pattern. The burden of, of Babylon? Yes, he was discussing Babylon all throughout the chapter. And he goes right back to it in verse 19 to confirm it, to uh, reassure us that when we're reading about 
the, the punishment of the world. It is the punishment of Babylon. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see as we go on why that's so important. Because Babylon is punished after the Great Tribulation. And we're living in the days after the Great Tribulation. And, and that means when we read about what God has to say about Babylon, it's going to relate to these days after that tribulation. Um, let's return to Jeremiah 50. And verse 1 said again, The word that Jehovah spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Um, just want to mention the Chaldeans. They're... Um, they're the people that inhabit Babylon. They're, they're um, Babylonians, or also known as Chaldeans. You, you really can't separate them. Um, remember, um, Abram came out of Ur of the Chaldees. He basically came out of Babylon. There, there is like a historical prefiguring of what God later intended to do when um, He would command His people to uh, to flee Babylon. Well, um, the Chaldeans we find in Jeremiah chapter 21. In Jeremiah 21, they'll be discussed there in verse 4. Thus saith Jehovah God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of this city. And also in verse 7, And afterwards saith Jehovah, I will deliver Zedekiah king of Judah and his servants and the people, and such as are left in this city from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, neither have pity, nor have mercy. And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live and his life shall be unto him for a prey. Again, the, the Chaldeans are synonymous with Babylon as God commanded to go to Babylon to leave Judah. And, and, you know, this command remains in effect. God never rescinded the command to come out of the church as, as, a, as we probably all know individuals that have returned. That's the last thing anybody wants to do because it's the worst place imaginable the, the church remains as a, a image to the beast, even though Satan is no longer ruling there. And God, uh, he, he ended Israel, the nation of Israel. And should we go back and be Jews? It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. He, he's through with the nation of Israel, and he's been through with them. And then he... Uh, um, he separated from the church. He ended that relationship. They're no longer his representatives on earth. And to go back to the church, you might as well go to the synagogue. It's exactly the same thing. We're, we're called to, um, to come out into the world, and that's where we remain and, until the Lord takes us into heavenly Jerusalem, into the Jerusalem above. Well, one other verse in Jeremiah 22, 25, it says, And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. So the Chaldeans, whenever you see Chaldea or the, the Chaldees or the Chaldeans, just think Babylon. They're, they're basically one in the same. Verse 2 of Jeremiah 50 says, Declare ye among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard, publish, and conceal not, say, Babylon is taken. Well, 
if God is indicating that Babylon represents the world and his judgment upon them, it comes after the tribulation, and we're living in the days after that tribulation, then the Lord's speaking to us. And what's he telling us? Declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Now talk about a strong emphasis. You, you can't get any stronger than that to get the point across. And, and perhaps we need that. We need to hear this because we've been sitting back and we've been very quiet. And I'm sure that was all part of the Lord's will and all part of his plan. But, uh, you know, the believers are always called to share truth. So that's one reason why we would want to continue to publish the teachings of the Bible or the, the Bible itself with the world. Secondly, we're called upon in these days to feed sheep. And who are the sheep? All the elect, and it's a great multitude that are found all over the world. Do you know who the sheep are? I don't know who the sheep are. Just like we never previously knew who was God's elect and who wasn't God's elect. So what did we have to do? We had to publish the gospel to all the world so that God would seek and find his lost sheep and bring them into the fold. And now God... Christ commands us to feed my sheep. Well, we don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. So what's, what's to be done? Publish the information, the truth, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Publish these things to the world so that they hear and the elect amongst them, the sheep will be fed. That there's no other way around that. And, and God here is emphasizing this uh, in a big way. Declare ye among the nations. The word declare is found in Isaiah 48 and verses 20 and 21. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. Declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, Jehovah has redeemed his servant Jacob. There again, in the context of going forth of Babylon, and, and by the way, um, that has to do with salvation. That, that relates to, to leaving the world as God uh, puts us safely into the sheepfold. Or just picture entering, Noah and his family entering the ark. They... They left the world into the safety of the ark. And, and so when God says, go ye forth of Babylon, uh, deliver everyone his soul, it says in another place, it has to do with uh, be saved. That is to seek the Lord in the day he was saving before this day of his anger come upon us. And here again, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare ye Tell this, utter it again, f four different words, four different words. God could say it in one word, but he's emphasizing and re-emphasizing. Now, the word publish is found in Esther, Esther 1, verse 20. And this is when Vashti was commanded no more to come before the king. And verse 20, And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both the great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Well, that's the word published. And it's pretty evident what God means. Make this known. Make this known. That this is something to be shared with others. Now, the word standard um, is 
I don't know if you noticed it, but it's in Isaiah 13. In Isaiah 13, we read this. In verse 1, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner, that's the same word as standard, or ensign in some places, upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. So here in the context of the Lord describing the judgment upon Babylon, he says, lift up a banner, lift up a standard. And put it on a high mountain. And why? Well, everybody could see it if it's on a high mountain. And, and then finally, conceal not uh, that, um, that um, idea is, or that those words are found in Job. In chapter 6, verse 10. Then should I yet have comfort, yea, I would harden myself in sorrow, let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. This is the Word of God. We're not to conceal it. We're not to hide it. We're, we're to do the opposite and, and to share it as much as possible. Now, I'm just going to turn to one more place, and I'm still looking into this, but I'll just share the idea. And maybe you've heard this before, but it... It, it's something that we should look at in the light of this in Revelation chapter 10 when it says in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. Now the word begin should be translated about. It's the same word that's found in um, verse 4 of Revelation 10 when John, John says, I was about to write, and then he heard a voice saying, seal those things and write them not. So did he write? He didn't write. He was about to write. He had pen to paper, and God says, don't write. So that's the same word. When he shall be about to sound, has he sounded? No. The mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Now back in verse 2 of Revelation 10, he had in his hand a little book open. And that um, the Greek tense would actually literally be having been opened. So this is indicating the book, the Bible, has already been opened. And, and God did that at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. And so the book having been opened, go and take that book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten, eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now the book is the Bible, the Word of God. So we can understand why in it, it's in his mouth sweet as honey. God likens his statutes, his word to honey. And, and it, it is, no matter what we read, isn't it sweet? Everywhere in the Bible, all scripture, it's wonderful, it's beautiful to the believer, whether... It, it's talking about God's love or God's wrath. It's all good to us because we just simply love the Word of God. But on the other hand, why did it make his belly bitter? What, what comes out of the belly normally? Look at John 7. Right. John 7 says... In uh, verse 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture is said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Living water. So if a believer shares the gospel, at, at, you know, all through history practically, 
We could expect that God might bless it to one or, or to another and save some. It was living water. But, but uh, in Revelation 10, when he eats the little book, the Word of God, it's honey in his mouth, but it makes his belly bitter. And in Revelation 8, it says in verse 11, In the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The water of the gospel in the churches is being described in Revelation 8. Why did they become bitter? Because God judged the churches and congregations. He removed the Holy Spirit and took away the power of the Bible in the church to save. And so the waters within the congregations were bitter waters and no one became saved during the, the 23 years of when God's judgment began at the house of God and throughout the great tribulation period. So the waters became bitter and believers have living water in our belly. And here it, it, John is told, take the book, eat it, and it's, it's the true Word of God, so it's like honey in our mouth. But in our belly, in our belly, it's bitter because we, we now are realizing that God has shut the door to heaven, that there is no more um, glorious rivers of water that are opening up in the wilderness, in desolate lands, that the waters have dried up. That, that there is no more salvation for the people of earth. And, and so God uh, gives that indication. Then look in verse 11 of Revelation 10. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. In that context, where our bellies are bitter, God says, prophesy again. And that fits with what we're reading in Jeremiah 50. That declare ye, publish, set up a standard, and conceal not what God is, is telling to us. Well, let's stop here. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for... Uh, your word and we thank you for uh, all the truths that we find in it and father we thank you also that uh, that even though we can grow tired and weary and and we can uh, faint that it is you who keeps us and upholds us and strengthens us and you do not grow tired or weary and you do not faint. And we have access to you where you can strengthen us and make us strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. And we do pray that you would help us to strengthen us to endure these days and, and to live uh, in a way that is pleasing to you. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our, our uh, failures. Uh, especially over the last couple of years. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to glorify you in the fires, to glorify your name uh, amongst all those in the world that will see these things in the day of your visitation. And Father, we ask for your blessing, uh, although we don't deserve it for anything that we've done, but only for Christ's sake, we pray. In his name, amen.